Hey investor friends, I'm Michelle Markey and if you've been on the internets at all in 2021, you've probably adopted some new pop culture terms like diamond hands, paper hands, to the moon, YOLO and HODL and we all have a Reddit sub page to thank known as Wall Street Bets and we've learned about Wall Street Bets' epic crusade against the big bad hedge funds that were shorting the stocks of favorite companies like GameStop and AMC and then a bunch of retail investors like you and myself gathered on this Reddit forum to try to save some of these companies by pouring their investing dollars into buying these company stocks so that they would avoid some of the fate that when some companies are shorted so much and then there's a loss of investor faith in these companies they might be on their way to bankruptcy and other negative outcomes. So in order to avoid that fate in this classic David versus Goliath tale, a bunch of retail people banded together so that companies could be saved from some of these bad hedge funds. And it will probably be an epic movie someday called The Big Short Squeeze or something like that, named similarly after the popular 2015 The Big Short, which I'll also talk about a little bit in more detail. And my main goal today is to talk about what hedge funds are, who are they for, their fee structure, what are some of their strategies and stats, and I hope my high-level understanding will be helpful to you as to improving your understanding of what hedge funds are and the role and purpose they serve. And since you only live once, I'd love if you could please diamond hands your way to hitting that like button and please subscribe because it greatly helps out with the YouTube algorithm and because I greatly appreciate it. Thanks. You've probably come across articles and videos like mine detailing the epic saga of Redditors going up against Wall Street and how someone who is known as Roaring Kitty on YouTube or goes by abbreviated DFV on Reddit was posting his YOLO post about investing in the beleaguered GameStop and that gained tremendous momentum that a bunch of people wanted to invest so much so that the GameStop stock had been trading in the teens in January 2021 and then it shot up to almost $500 at the height of the frenzy of buying into GameStop in February 2021 until it came crashing down and now it's hovering around the $200 range per share and that's still an increase of over 1,100% since January, which is incredible. And some of this started because Roaring Kitty discovered years ago, actually, and I shared this one example of how 11 months ago he shared from highshortinterest.com how GameStop had been being shorted at around or a little bit above 100% of the amount of publicly available shares to trade and because GameStop was being shorted at more than 100% of the amount of shares available, he decided that it was sensible to invest in this company because it had more assets on its books than how much it was currently being priced at in the markets. So for Roaring Kitty, his investment in GameStop ended up paying off in spades. And for a lot of people, they joined in on the ride and some of them had really good stories to end with. And there were also some bad endings, like there were significant losses for a lot of major hedge funds, and there was at least one that has closed down. So although there were lots of good things that came about from this epic adventure of Redditors against Wall Street, there were also some cautionary tales of what can happen with hedge funds out of this story. The Big Short was not only a movie, but was also a 2010 book by Michael Lewis that featured a hedge fund that prevailed during the great financial and housing crisis, or also known as the Great Recession, in which a doctor turned hedge fund manager named Michael Burry was able to correctly predict that there were so many at-risk subprime mortgage loans, and when interest rates were going to go up, they were gonna put a lot of those mortgage-backed securities and related derivative investment vehicles in a lot of trouble, 
and he was able to effectively short mortgage-backed securities such that Scion Capital was able to generate a increase in its value and over $2.69 billion of profits. So that was pretty amazing of Michael Burry to achieve and correctly pull that off during a time when nobody thought the housing market in its bubble would burst. And something else I learned is that 13 F filings that show the holdings of funds like Michael Burry's Scion Capital shows from say 2008 what his holdings and in individual companies were. So these were company stocks that he bought, but what 13 F filings don't show is what these funds are shorting. So that's something that as this Quora article talks about is curious as to why we don't have transparency into what kinds of securities like stocks, bonds, derivatives, and other kinds of assets that funds are shorting. So this is something that we don't know a lot about, but that we come to find out about through sources like from highshortinterest.com or other places where we can kind of figure out how much a stock might be being shorted. A lot of you watching are retail investors like myself, and in our universe, we can invest through our retirement investment accounts like Roth IRAs and 401ks or our individual investing accounts in things like stocks, bonds, mutual funds or index funds or ETFs, and also real estate. And we have similar goals to what hedge funds might have in that they want to earn above average rates of return and they want to minimize the risks in investing and they want to have a portfolio that has enough diversification so that they're not too overly concentrated in certain assets but they just have a much bigger universe and different kinds of tools to work with that are on a professional grade that we as retail investors are not usually privy to. So you can think of hedge funds as being a sort of exclusive investing club. I'd like you to brace yourself for some hedge fund information I'm about to share that may come off as a little bit dry, but it's by the book and written in my own words that I borrowed from places like Investopedia and other sources. And I worked hard to prepare the following slides and I hope you get something out of them because I try to explain hedge funds in a simple and straightforward way. What exactly is a hedge fund, you may be wondering, and I'll tell you. A hedge fund is an actively managed alternative investment fund using pooled funds from accredited investors to try to achieve excess returns or also known as its alpha. And all you need to know with alpha is that it's basically an amount that's above a certain benchmark or index that the hedge fund is trying to compete against. So if the S&P 500 generated a rate of return of 10% and the hedge fund generated a return of 13%, then the hedge fund might have an alpha of 3%. And then there's also another term known as beta, which is the volatility relative to a benchmark or let's say the S&P 500 again. So although there's these terms in investing and there's all kinds of equations and more Greek letters that are usually involved when measuring stuff with hedge fund investments, you don't have to worry too much about that because that's the extent I'm gonna talk about with alpha and beta. And then to give a little bit of history, someone by the name of Alfred Winslow Jones, who was a writer and sociologist, established the first hedge fund in 1949. I'm sure you've heard of the idiom, hedge one's bets, where you want to avoid some commitment when you're facing a difficult choice. And the word hedge means to limit or qualify something by conditions or exceptions. So the word hedge became this type of fund's name when A.W. Jones was trying to minimize the investment risks of holding stock for the long term by selling other stocks short in the short term. And this became also known as the classic long short equities model of hedge funds. And just as another note, hedge funds are often limited partnerships as in the general partner or hedge fund manager manages the fund and has unlimited liability, but limited partners are investors in the fund who have limited liability and they can only lose what they've invested in the fund. To give an example of the classic long short hedge, let's say a fund manager 
wants to have stock A as its long position and stock B as its short position. So with stock A, the fund manager in 2021 buys and holds shares for 10 years, assuming the price rises eventually throughout those years. And then in shorting stock B, in 2021, the fund manager borrows shares from a broker, sells them immediately to the market, and then assuming the stock's price declines at some point soon, they eventually buy shares at a cheaper price later in 2021 to make a profit on the difference. And also just to mention that the use of leverage or borrowed money can help amplify returns or lead to ruin. And I'll explain a little bit more about the power of leverage. Investment banks and other financial institutions can be prime brokers who offer margin financing or a form of borrowed money to hedge funds and also family offices. And there was a case in recent months with the Archegos Fund, which was a family office and not a hedge fund, but it used leverage in a similar way that a lot of hedge funds do to try to get increased returns on investments. And the short story is that things went wrong and then a bunch of banks like Nomura, Credit Suisse, UBS, and Morgan Stanley were all trying to get out of the Archegos Fund at the same time and they were not all able to get out at the same time and that led to a bunch of losses and a big scandal. And so that's a cautionary tale also when it comes to using leverage to try to get higher rates of return that investment banks are looking for and that sometimes funds like hedge funds or family offices can run into with problems. Since the 80s and 90s, hedge funds have gained tremendous popularity and there could be over 10,000 to maybe 15,000 hedge funds out there, but there are still plenty that close every year. And even though their performance in recent years after the great financial crisis or great recession has worsened according to a study discussed in a Forbes article, it's hard to avoid the fact that hedge funds still carry a lot of clout and they have over $3.8 trillion of assets under management as of 2020 figures. And they also can invest in basically anything like stocks, bonds, derivatives, real estate, land, commodities, or currencies. And their performance is often judged in either absolute returns, like their target is to hit 15% or by relative returns, like aiming for 3% above the S&P 500. And there are some top 10 hedge funds like BlackRock Advisors, AQR Capital Management, Bridgewater Associates, and more that I'm not going to say all of them, but you can see them on this slide. And I just wanted to note with Bridgewater Associates, one of my favorite investors named Ray Dalio heads up Bridgewater, and he's got a lot of great literature out there that's publicly available. And I highly recommend reading his principles or his works on corporate debt. It's a fascinating study to get to learn more about how this billionaire hedge fund investor thinks about macroeconomic themes, and that can all give us a great education about what's going on in the world. Sadly, not everyone can invest in hedge funds. They're only open to sophisticated investors or what American federal securities law considers to be accredited investors. And they include high net worth individuals with $200,000 of annual income for the last two years or a net worth of $1 million, excluding the value of their primary residence. Or they could also be institutional investors such as public and corporate pension funds, charitable foundations, nonprofit organizations, university endowment funds, family offices, central banks, and foreign governments. So that's just something to keep in mind if you aim to be the type of investor who can invest in a hedge fund someday. There are many reasons why a lot of institutions partner with hedge funds, and I'll talk a little bit about what some of those reasons are. But then sometimes there could also be some negative outcomes that I'll also mention an example of. And reasons why institutions partner with hedge funds is because they want their investments to be able to generate returns that fund retiree benefits, provide university scholarships and fund research, and help the missions of community foundations and nonprofit organizations. But then sometimes, like this Market Watch article talks about, Sometimes pension funds like the New York's Metropolitan Transportation Authority can lose hundreds of millions of dollars in 
complicated financial vehicles that are part of hedge funds and then when something goes wrong they could be losing out on a lot more money than if they just stuck with investing in boring stocks and bonds but maybe because they were trying to make up for some lost amounts of funds in the pension fund they may be going with some hedge fund strategies that don't always pan out so this is another lesson to learn to talk about some of the strategies that hedge funds use and you can think of these as tools in their tool belt that they use to generate returns and because hedge funds are less regulated by the u.s securities and exchange commission than mutual funds or etfs they have way more freedom to use different kinds of investment strategies that often employ leverage and they include equity which is long and short positions in equity and derivative securities relative value which is long and short positions in multiple securities with perceived price discrepancies global macro which is strategies using macroeconomic themes and variables event driven which includes merger arbitrage distressed restructuring activists influencing management decisions and other special situations and then there's more that are also multi-strategy combinations of many more things that I'm not going to name because I don't even know how to begin explaining some of them, but you can read up and learn more about all these different kinds of strategies that hedge funds use to generate outsized returns, hopefully. Finally, for the cherry on top of the ice cream sundae that is my high-level understanding of how hedge funds work is the very controversial hedge fund fee structure. And this is controversial because hedge funds are expected to generate outsized returns and when they don't it makes people seriously question their fee structure and why the hedge fund managers are deserving to get certain amounts of fees based on whether they perform or not and so that's why a lot of people can get really unhappy about hedge funds and how it seems to be that sometimes they just make lots of money and haven't really delivered and to explain a little bit the classic hedge fund free structure is known as 2 and 20 where you get a 2% fee for assets under management and no matter what a fund manager gets paid the 2% let's say and then there's a 20% of performance or incentive fee that gets added to if the fund generates profits so the fund manager might get 20% of the profits generated above a certain hurdle rate and I'll give you an example of what this means. As an example of the 2 and 20 compensation for a general partner or the hedge fund manager, there's a 2% management fee on $100 million of assets under management. So the general partner gets $2 million for that alone, no matter how they perform for the year. And then if there's a hurdle rate of 3% and the fund ends up returning 15%, then the hedge fund manager gets an additional 20% performance fee on the 12% difference, which is another $2.4 million. So in total, the hedge fund manager could be getting $4.4 million for the year on $100 million of assets under management. And in recent years, there's been research that's shown that the average management fee has actually declined to an average of 1.48%, with the performance or incentive fee declining to 17.4%. So you can see that there's some changes happening from the classic 2 and 20 compensation structure to actually rewarding hedge fund managers with less because maybe they haven't been generating the expected returns. One last little tidbit that's like taking a bite out of the waffle cone underneath the ice cream sundae is that unlike us retail investors who can move in and out of most securities like stocks and index funds at almost any time, Investors in hedge funds have to have their funds invested during a lockup period where they cannot take out any of their investments for a long amount of time. And then there's a period, maybe once every quarter or year, known as the liquidity period, where they then can withdraw their funds. And that is a big difference between retail and hedge fund investors. So something just to keep in mind where we retail investors have a little bit more freedom in that way and maybe that could be both a curse and a blessing who knows if it's better to just stay disciplined and lock up your money for longer periods of time 
but I know that by having money locked up in hedge funds that they're able to invest based on knowing that they have a consistent amount of capital available to deploy in investment opportunities. But maybe there's something to be said about trying to maintain some of that discipline that hedge funds try to employ. And if you enjoyed this video or learned something, please like and subscribe. And I'd love to hear from you in the comments. And I wish you well on your journey to becoming the best investor you can be. Till next time.